Welcome to the Modern CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping accounting firms achieve success. If you're an accounting firm owner who wants to learn how to grow your firm by providing virtual CFO services, then this podcast is for you. All right, welcome to today's episode of the Modern CPA Success Show. I'm Tom Waddleton. I work for Summit CPA Group, a division of Anders CPA and Advisors. I've been here for about five years and I do a virtual CFO role. I'm joined as usual with Adam Hale. So Adam is one of the founders of Summit CPA Group. Um, He is now a partner of Anders CPA and Associates, um, passionate about forecasting, our current chief operating officer and mentor and coach to a lot of the the CFOs. So we're talking about playing guru today. Um, We're joined by Christian Weilage. So let me go backwards in time for your introduction, Christian. So prior to joining Plan Guru in 2010, you worked for IBM as a worldwide plan analyst for the Global Technology Services Group. Backwards from IBM, then you went to business school and worked in both middle investment banking at Wachovia Securities. And you hold bachelor's degrees from Franklin Marshall Colleges and MBA from the University of Pittsburgh, Katz School of Business. Welcome. I'm I'm feeling unachieving just reading through your bio, <laughs> but I would love. So we kind of went backwards for that. But can you tell us a little bit your story and kind of what led you to now be the CEO of Plan Guru? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me on. Uh, excited to be on your podcast. I've been working with Adam for years, and uh, it's fun to do something like this. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, but yeah, sure. uh, I mean, I think from the purposes of this discussion, my career really started at IBM. You know, well, uh, I worked for as an intern at a little middle market investment bank. Um, you know, worked on the sale of a brewery and some other things. It was cool exposure, um, but you know, the financial modeling requirements of doing something like that is not um, terribly complicated. Is as sort of doing operating budgets and forecasts. And uh, but when I started with IBM, I was. Uh, working across all of their brands for their sales and distribution for North America, um, doing projections by the regions and uh, by brand and uh, sort of as the interface between the actual sales teams and the executive staff. And then, and then I became the worldwide plan analyst uh, for their global technology services group, um, which was their outsourcing business at the time, the biggest revenue brand. Um, so it was a great experience uh, in terms of, um, seeing uh, what a budgeting and forecasting cadence looks like at a world-class uh, corporate finance organization. Um, you know, uh, I, we were doing all of our budgeting in Excel there, you know, and uh, I had some very long nights in the Somers campus uh, in, in Westchester, like <laughs> trying to figure out what, what was going on with my model and having like a nervous breakdown because we were going to our monk in the morning. Uh, so I got that side of it. So I, I, I do have quite a bit of empathy for a customer who's in a bind. Uh, so that's, I think, part of what how we built our service around at Plan Guru is my uh, trauma from the, those long nights of, of trying to figure <laughs> out how, what's wrong with my model or whatever. So, um, But, you know, I did not uh, – this almost sounds like too co- – like ridiculously coincidental that it can't be possibly true, but – uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, I was looking for banking jobs. I was looking for, mm-hmm. um, you know, more traditional finance roles, like is you know, is just like what you get exposed to in school. Uh, but when the opportunity from IBM came up, I just sounded actually a lot more interesting um, than, you know, working for a bank or something. Uh, so I took that. But, you know, so again, back to the coincidentally, my, my father um, mm-hmm. had developed playing guru all the way back in in started development in the, in the late nineties, believe it or not, um, and rolled out uh, the wow. first version of Plan Guru and very much intended it to be a, a lifestyle business, meaning, you know, he could wake up in the morning, check his emails, uh, reply to people on his terms. Uh, and uh, they uh, ha- you know had some success getting customers from their old customer list because my father and his business partner, Sally Sprankel, who's uh, the real technical uh, of the of the original Plan Guru founders, crew. I mean, my my father taught himself to code, but he's an accountant CPA by trade. Um, worked for Ernst and Ernst in San Francisco. Uh, moved back to Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, uh, and helped in the early days of Parente Randolph, uh, what became Parente Beard, and is now Baker Tilly. You know, so he 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 was in the accounting space again. Got into accounting technology, taught himself to code while working with Sally, who is a true computer programming genius. 
And again, we're really running Plain Guru as a lifestyle business. And uh, again, their previous product was something called Work Papers Plus, uh, which was the first trial balance software that an independent accounting firm could put on a laptop and take out to a, a site and do an audit on a laptop instead of paper. So they, they've been at it for even longer than, cool. than, than Plain Guru. But anyway, um, after getting that exposure at IBM, you know, I really basically said to my father, uh, I get what you're doing now. Like it makes a lot more sense to me. You know, my previous exposure was in the financial services sector where it was all just about doing some high level projections to satisfy a bank or something, you know, but like being exposed to that, that cadence at IBM where we review our forecast and do the budget versus actual comparisons. I said, you know, it really dawned on me how that core exercise drives performance, drives results, drives profitability. And I said, Hey, why, you know, why, this with all these principles apply to the small business space and i, I was basically i saw i'm gonna quit my job at ibm and become the third employee to which he said no don't do that <laughs> you know <laughs> i can't even for, uh, right in for in for maybe a decade he uh was still angry you know he never got over it and, and wished i didn't uh but over the last you know couple of years as our cloud products really matured I, he's actually he's actually really gotten involved in the business specifically on testing, you know, so he, you know, he doesn't, oh. instead of being the person that gets, you know, crushed by all the testing demands and the bugs and the, and the improvements, he's now sitting as the outside gets to beat up our current developers. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, that again, so I jumped into the business, uh, uh, Trip Graham, our other, you know, uh, long-term partner, been with the business for 12 years like me. Um, he became the fourth employee shortly thereafter, you know, and uh, we've been building the business ever since. Uh, you know, we we had been a desktop product until pretty recently just because of the rigors of, you know, the financial modeling. And when you build this huge model with all these calculations, it's not exactly something that was made for a web browser. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. we... Uh, we're, I think we're lucky that we can, you know, we came out with another desktop product, you know, right around the time I joined the company, they redeveloped the product. Uh, again, you know, they developed it and, you know, released something in 2000, released another sort of a desktop version in 2011. And, um, and we're lucky that we didn't try to go to the cloud at that point. It just wouldn't have worked. Um, the experience that we provide wouldn't have worked. Um, so we built a loyal customer base along the way with our desktop product. And, and, and again, now, are fully uh, cloud-based uh, and, um, you know, we're excited at where we are. So that's the story of uh, my past. And how I got so Christian, you said 12 years, 12 years. Is that I how long so. you've been there? It's coming up on 13. Okay. Cause I got to think about my timeline now because yeah, I always tell people like, yeah, it's probably right around the same time we started using plan guru um, because we ended up, you know, um, similar to you, just, Excel, just the pains of Excel. Yeah. Everybody hard codes a formula somewhere um, because you need to on the fly and then you forget about it. And then you're like, why doesn't anything foot? And yeah. so you always have all these challenges. And for us in our business mm -hmm. cycle, what we ended up finding is that we needed to figure out a way to productize advisory services. And so for us, that silver bullet was really a financial forecast, which again, you can do technically on Excel, not very well because of those issues that we mentioned, but, you know, obviously you're passionate about financial forecasting, both in your prior history. And, you know, I'd hope even more now that, you know, that's what you, that's what you're doing. So why do you think it's, uh, you know, so important, you know, for, you know, not only current state or future state of accounting, you know, as an industry? I mean, I think the, I mean, obviously we, understand that automation uh, not not only does it uh, eliminate sort of busy work that that doesn't add any value um, but it also like gives us real you know it's close to real time I mean whatever real time is for your business uh, you know so, some accounts might be accurate in the middle of the month and some have, might be totally off but you, you do what you can to keep it accurate but um, at, you know, it's not just about automating that stuff away. It's about then having the numbers to do the CFO work. Um, so firms really need to, you know, embrace sort of the, the automate, you know, as the automation stuff comes on, you can view it as something that's going to eat into your revenues because it's going to take away some of this busy work you're doing, or you can view it as a tool to delivering these high value services that you can, you know, that are, you can deliver much more profitably. 
And, you know, the firms that are doing a good job at this, like Summit and, and the firms they advise, are, are going to end up taking those customers if you don't automate and move into this to the CFO stuff. So, um, you know, I think it's at a critical juncture where the, the firms that are just, we, you know, we talk to a lot of big firms that are so compartmentalized, they can't get a handle on embracing this stuff systematically. But a lot of the younger firms that have grown up based around providing these advisory services are wildly successful in, in hiring as many people as they can and really embracing this model. So firms that don't embrace this model, I think, are just slowly going to lose their customers to the people who sort of get this stuff. You know, same same amount of time is being spent each month, but so much more of it is in the value add services. And finally, you know, the everyone talks about being this trusted business advisor and the process of sitting down and saying, what are we going to do? It just, it naturally extracts those recommendations from you. You know, you have all this exposure to all these different businesses and you see so many different things, but when you're just looking at historicals, it doesn't matter how great you analyze it and slice and dice it. There's nothing like sitting down and saying, okay, what's going to happen next month? What's going to happen the month after that? And then when they tell you what they think is going to happen, you could, that switch goes off in your head where you say, hey, well, this other customer had a similar situation to yours, and there you go. And that's where the, you know, budgeting has value as businesses get larger and they have more people to hold accountable, but sort of any uh, small business can greatly benefit from that forecasting cadence and become that advisor that's adding value all the time. Because again, the, those, are the, those are the firms that are going to win in the long run. I, I think it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say like I was actually just talking to another um, CPA firm that was doing VCFO services. And I think, you know, crystal balling is important. You know, clients always want to just know what's the future look like and what's everybody else doing, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but I do think to your point it brings a lot more insight even to the historical stuff because it's always death by a thousand cuts, right? Like, Hey, we did crappy last month. Why? Well, it was this and it was that. Um, but once you get really intentional with what those numbers mean, um, and whenever I was talking to the CP, uh, whenever I was talking to the CPA and I was asking him how he does financial forecasting, cause that's, you know, obviously a little bit of different skill. He's like talking about this example of this trucking company that he was working with and they were telling him what their sales goals were going to be and all this other stuff. And, and then he asked him, okay, so what's your average truck revenue per day? And they said, oh, well, we think it's this. And he goes, oh, well, then you're probably about 20 trucks short of your sales goal, right? And they're like, what do you mean? No, we're not adding any more vehicles. Mm. He's like, well, then your math's wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like, so obviously, it, it, like, again, it just brings a lot more insight even to, to the today numbers and the reason why the yesterday numbers were wrong. And then it, and then it helps people get intentional with you know, figuring out how they're going to get to that goal. So, uh, yeah, extremely, extremely important, I think. Yeah. And Chris, I can't think of a recent conference I've been to where they don't talk about people don't want to pay to hear you talk about what happened in the past. They want to look forward. Right. And so it's all about that forecast. And I love the connection you made to being the advisor because you are in a great position, just like Adam's example. Someone says what they're going to do, but it just naturally tees up those kind of questions as you're trying to build that. See, I mean, like you can you can go through the motions sure. when reviewing historical data. Uh, you, when you're sitting there going, okay, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? And is, does the model reflect that? That's sort of just like a different discussion. And it's like, you know, I, I, should, I should actually get the <laughs> quote right because I like half quote this all the time, but they say, you know, 90% mm, sure. of the success in life is showing up or something like that. I'm, I'm sure there's other people that completely disagree with that analogy, but... It is about just showing up to that meeting, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's weekly for some, you know, like yep. someone has some weekly customers, I, Adam, you've said, or whether it's monthly, like we've closed the books, we've, we compared what happened. Hey, last month you said this was going to happen. Well, why didn't it, you know, and then, okay, well, what can we do to change that outcome in the future? You, you just sort of, is, if you're, if you're pushing the client, you can't just go through the motions and then it just stirs up conversations, stirs up discussions that otherwise never would have happened. And again, then you get the good idea about how they can improve their business in some way. So, and, and, it, and again, it doesn't have to be some big, like, like at IBM, you know, we'd be scrambling for 10 days or, you know, like run, you know, going crazy, you know, uh, yeah. scared of going down to Armand headquarters, you know, at least I was. Yeah. No. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, 
it doesn't have to be like that though. Like for a small business, single QuickBooks class, million in revenue, you get you can get together for like half an hour and just respin the forecast and. There's just so much value in that. And, you know, as the business gets bigger, more complicated and has the money to pay you, uh, then you and can I, get more complicated with it. But, you know, that's sort of the biggest thing I'm preaching now is that we always, um, you know, we get a new prospect and uh, they uh, are so gun ho about this and they've got 40 clients. Most complicated. And who do they start <laughs> <Yes>. with? <laughs> Their biggest, most complicated client who has and I'm like, listen, you're like going to the ski rental shop, getting a pair of rental boots, rental skis. You never <laughs> skied before. Now you're going again, double diving. You know, good, good luck with that. Um, so, I mean, we, if they need to do that because the client needs it, you know, we'll help them do it and we'll get it done. But, you know, they, I think there's a tendency to overlook some of their smaller customers who they could, that, that they could, you know, go down, go down a green circle first and then, um, and then sort of uh, yeah. build from there, um, you know, so because a lot of the most successful advisors I know have a handful of clients sub 10 million yeah. bucks where the monthly thing is just a couple hours a month. And, um, you know, we work with a lot of, you know, I call them lone wolf fractional CFOs. They sure. don't, they don't yeah. want any teammates. They just want to do their thing. And, uh, you know, so. But but the most successful ones I work with, yeah, occasionally they got that big company and they do a big exit, but they have, you know, four or five, six uh, customers that are just on a really yeah. standard. To your point about building teams. the first forecast, Adam and I coached a CPA and he actually built a forecast of his own practice and he had a very small practice. But I think it was a huge education for him. And he came back and there were some other CPAs on the call that were watching it and they were learning. But he had two or three drivers and had this revenue and then here's the cost. And it, it was a fairly simple model. But I, to your point, I think he learned so much that he probably next could take on a little bit tougher client. Are you interested in offering virtual CFO services at your firm or scaling your existing service offerings? The Virtual CFO Playbook, How to Land $60,000 a Year Clients and Provide a Killer Client Experience is an online series of modules that will equip you with essential tools for creating and delivering scalable VCFO services. These approaches have helped Summit CPA grow from $500,000 to upwards of $5 million in revenue over the past decade. If you're ready to grow your firm, visit summitcpa.net slash VCFO playbook to enroll now. Yeah, I mean, what are you seeing the biggest obstacles for implementation because FP&A software in general can be a little mm -hmm. intimidating. So what what typically are you seeing or hearing either either people saying don't want to get it? Yeah, it's really um, when someone has a clear design in their mind, th then it's easy. Uh, I think the, the thing people struggle with the most and I this, I, you know, this is kind of a I mean, it's it's that it's that creativity to, to figure out what the design should be, how detailed should we get, right? Like, do we keep it high level mm. or do we say we're not that good, you know, and just pick a, you know, grow at 3%, right? Like, because it's sometimes because it doesn't matter that much, that, that individual account, or sometimes it's just because like spending all this time building out all these drivers is sometimes can be more trouble than it's worth. But it's, but other times, you know, we, there's people that, try to dumb it down too much. And, and so it's that, you know, straddling that line and building something that's going to be effective uh, and actually drive better decisions. Um, but at the same time, be manageable. You know, like the, the worst thing is uh, somebody has this great idea and we, they say, we're going to do it this way. And we build it out like revenue, you know, inventory and sales and cogs product by product. And then they come back and go, oh, yeah. the client can't <laughs> track inventory at this level. You know, like right. that all. <laughs> That whole idea of brilliant your museum thing yeah. you built, you know, it's doesn't mean anything. It's useless. Like, yeah. We gotta, <laughs> yeah, simplicity. And, is, and that's very frustrating, you know, for someone who's new at it. You know, once you have a handful under your belt, um, then you know, we, it, it becomes easy. You know, and, and again, that's a huge part of our of what we do at Plain Guru in terms of. Just be, you know, people, all different people want different things. We have tons of awesome clients, you know, I assume we, some of, I mean, our best clients are the ones that we never talk to that just go to our huge video tutorial library and figure it out because they've been doing this for 20 years. Um, but if, you know, but we're happy to 
if you need more uh, assistance in the, in the onboarding and especially with that design stuff, because like mm -hmm. two, you know, two minds and sometimes even three minds are better than one, you know, and that's again, why, why the business advisory firm can play that role in, instead of us, like when the customer calls us directly, right. Is just uh, working with the client to, uh, you know, f figure out, you know, how detailed are we going to get tell, you know, asking them to go back and check, to see if they can track it at that level before we go off and build the model, you know, help them set up the model with them. Um, but you know, it, it's it's not uh, it's not like you know, create it's not like musical creativity that you just have or you don't. Uh, it's it's just the doing it a couple times gives you enough of a framework that you're then able to okay to come up with an approach uh, that that works that works. You know? So what you're saying is the obstacle typically isn't the tech as much as it is the design, you know, like kind of the fear of design. And, you know, whenever you're hearing the questions, it's not actually how to put the drivers in place or make the two things interact with one another. It's understanding how to design the forecast is usually what is a roadblock for a lot of people uh, using. 100%. I mean, um. Because I think playing right. Guru University is a great tool. And, and whenever people are talking to me all the time, you know, whenever they're asking about different um, FP&A softwares and stuff like that, and they're like, well, do you, you actually show us how to use the software? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, using the software is the, is the easier part. And like, in, for instance, I, again, I know your university, you have a, a great uh, library of videos that shows people how mm -hmm. to actually do it. But it's the design of it that where people, I think, get a little intimidated and maybe confused that it's not. Not necessarily how to use the software, it's how to design the plan. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we think we've designed a pretty uh, flexible tool. You know, it's also, it's turnkey when you need it to be, like with solving the cash flows and everything. And it's, but it's also very flexible in terms of building out custom supporting schedules and sheets and things like that. So from our perspective, it's, uh, Rare, you know, I mean, I, we've got some really cool stuff in the pipeline right now from a development perspective on the, you know, in our assumptions and KPI section mm. that's going to enable all of those problems to disappear. You know, when you have 20 years of feedback, it's it's pretty, you know, we've gotten to a point where we're, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be just as flexible as Excel, you know, basically, and pretty much just as easy to use. Um, so, yeah, like, again, rarely is it a, a, an implementation it's a design and, and, uh, where it is. uh, it's just, again, like how, you know, do I, do I forecast product by product? Do I region by region sales rep by sales mm -hmm. rep? Uh, who, who do we involve in the process? Right? Like, do I need to give this person a plain guru license? Like, are they actually going to have their own worksheet that they go in or am I just going to plug in the numbers and, you know, um, so it's like all, it's that web of, uh, you know, design that is what they struggle with the most. Um, yeah, so. I can see that. I mean, but obviously, you know, you're a player in the space and I, I think you were mentioning you've been heads down the last couple of years doing a lot of work on the, you know, the development side. Um, and I think that over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of emerging fintech in every space, but particularly in the FP&A space. I know there's a lot of, of uh, tools out there. I mean, what should, you know, as an advisor, what, what do you think is the most important things that people should be looking at whenever vetting, <laughs> yes. you know, an FP&A tool? Obviously, it's biased. <laughs> it's, you know, I, yeah. I get it, but I mean, um, but what I mean, what are the things that you think you know kind of are the you know the table stakes, if you will? Sure. Uh, yeah. It's hard to answer this question without just you know being a blind plug. That's yeah. okay. I mean, just yeah, just I mean, I would assume that's well, the intent well, around I what mean, your build is. I, I, I'm just gonna yeah again just throw. I, I sort of hit upon it earlier. I mean, the, there's mm -hmm. two competing requirements in doing this. This mo modeling is the hardest thing. Okay, right. Once the numbers have been solved for, slicing and dicing and rearranging them i mean it's not i'm not saying that's easy but that's much easier than the than the forward looking exercise that's part art part science you know and you know we pride ourselves on like you know the the so you you but you need something that's flexible that well the first the first requirement i should say is turnkey right you want something that's turnkey 
use. If you got to get something together for the bank, you can possibly whip it up in a couple hours. You can pull in the, if the accounts that um, <clears throat> parts of the budget that don't warrant scrutiny, right? You want to be able to set that up. You want to set it and forget it, right? <laughs> like, you, and you want your you want your you want your cash to be correct. You want your cash flow statement to be correct. So you want that turnkey, easy to use uh, for the easy stuff. Um, but then you need the flexibility to be able to for the important parts of the business, the, par the parts that warrant deeper scrutiny. You need the flexibility because like pick any industry, software as a service. You know, there's so many different variations of how that can look. You know, somebody might have one product, somebody might have 10 products. They might have a whole bunch of add on products. Um, they might have some that pay monthly, some that pay annually. Right. Like the flexibility to perfectly mirror how their business works is something you, you need. Um, you know, so those are mm -hmm. the, the, the solution that you feel balances those two competing requirements the, the best um, is what, I, you know, is, is what my recommendation is, you know, and obviously that's what we have always strived to achieve, you know, we're looking at development of playing guru through that matrix. Uh, and, yeah. you know, how, how can we give the Adam Hales of the world the complete flexibility that he, yeah. that he but, wants? But keep it simple but, enough that I actually know not do as it. smart as Adam Hale. Oh, like, no. The, the I, got, I need some features to, you know, like. Uh, T testing uh, the opposite way for sure on that one. I, I mean, for me, like, it's got to be easy. Um, it's got to be understandable, but it also has to yeah. be super flexible. Like you said, the balance sheet is the most important part of any kind of financial guidance that you're giving people. That's, you know, the ultimate, you know, lag indicator where you need to make sure all the everything plays out. And I think that there's a lot of tools out there that don't have the flexibility on the balance sheet that people need. And I think that, um, you know, with fintech, things get really cute nowadays. Like a lot of time is spent on what the deliverable looks like. And again, I want the output to look good whenever I need to push it. But I think that what I've seen anyway in this space is that a lot of fintech um, SaaS, FP&A software spend an extraordinary amount of time mm -hmm. on um, visual dashboards that quite frankly don't mean anything. Um, you know what I mean? Like whenever I see some of their trending and some of their stuff like that, and it's like, you got to get the nuts and bolts done right, you know, and you got to make it easy for me to get to the numbers that I need to get to in order to show somebody what the future looks like. Let me worry about what the visualization of it looks like later. And if you have that in addition to, then that's great. But sometimes, uh, um, whenever I see some of them or I look under the hood, I'm like, man, those look super cool. And then whenever you look at like the yeah. the heavy lift that they do, it's super basic. And it's like, meh, you know, not really for me. Um, and so yeah. I think that's that's an important um, distinction for me whenever I'm looking at it. It has to be easy, but it can't be so simple that I can't yeah. do complex things with it. Um, I think that's that's big. I mean, you, you hit on a good point there. I mean, f from our perspective, there's like, um, you know, we work with businesses in so many different ways. And uh, for the smallest businesses, you know, they have QuickBooks and then they have a bunch of other stuff, you know, and they dump that into Excel. Uh, you know, we're, we're adding a whole bunch of integrations here over the coming months here. But for now, we have, a, you know, we import directly from QuickBooks up zero, um, but the we are their ERP, you know, we pull, we're, we're the place where they aggregate everything and then do their reporting. Um, for some bigger businesses, they, they have a single source of all that information that we can import the data via one big Excel import. Uh, and they have the data aggregation before Plan Guru, and it not, you know, it's just out of one system right into Plan Guru, that's real easy. Uh, and on the back end though, a lot of times those people are taking the results of what they saw mm -hmm. for in Plan Guru and pushing it back into that system that the data came out of because that's where all the reports are, right? So um, we've we're, we've been laser focused on the modeling, you know, like, I mean, that's that, that's uh, what it's about. That's the hardest thing, you know, I keep saying that. Um, so, uh, I mean, we're definitely, we've, uh, we're, we're rolling out, sort of, we, we got some really great reports in playing Google, but rolling out our full dashboarding capabilities early next year and, uh, um, so it's, the, again, the display of the data is definitely important. Um, but, um, again, f finding that, that tool mm -hmm. that's in the middle where you create the new data, the, 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 the where you do the modeling again, that's, that's where you got to find something that you're most comfortable with. Um, 
and 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 you'll make the you'll make the counting of the beans. You'll get that done somehow, you know. And then on the, and then you'll figure out a way to display it too, um, and and interlace that with you know disseminate that to whoever you need to disseminate that to. Put put it in a beautiful board report, you know, if you need to. Um, but in the middle, you, you need that uh, that modeling that the the tool that's going to solve your budget, solve your forecasts, and the one that works best for you is the one you should go with. Yeah. So. As you talked about ease of use, the one thing I think Plan Guru does this really well. A huge part of the service we deliver is when we build the forecast with clients, it's up on the screen in the Zoom call that we're doing, and the client is working with the forecast with us. What we don't want to do is have them say, hey, I'm thinking about maybe adding two people and doing something different. Can you go off and come back with a model and tell me what that is? Right. That 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 adds work to me. But then as I'm coming back, they don't see what's behind that when they can understand it because you put it in a simple enough way within your tool and the model that's built that they're seeing the tweaks that are in there. Here are here is the amount you get per truck per week. You can see I've said you got this many. That's when I think the real value comes out because then they're very engaged and it's their forecast, not just the forecast that I have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think you guys do that well. I know that's a big part of it. Yeah, that's that's huge for me whenever. Yeah, we definitely don't want to you know, double our workload and have to go back and work after the yeah. fact. We want to make them kind of working meetings, you know, doing all the modeling and scenario. But if we can kind of switch gears, I know, let's just say, okay, we picked a tool, we love the tool, um, we've, we're have we implementing it, we're good to go. From your perspective, Christian, like, how are you seeing people charge for this, like within their practice and, you know, incorporated yeah. into their service delivery? A fixed monthly fee. Um, you know, that's by far, uh, of the folks that I know that are successful, um, what they're going with. I mean, some people do charge by the hour. Um, I obviously recommend the former, you know, I mean, I, that's, we, we sort of do encourage, I mean, we see people have the most success with that, you know, whether that's bolted on to a bunch of other services like tax, uh, I mean, it's usually, I mean, I know, I mean, if I'm correct, you guys have just one big price, right? And the CFO is baked into that. So, you know, we definitely yeah. see that from the firms that yeah. are following mm -hmm. your lead. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think that for the, for the firm, for the more traditional firm who's trying to get into this, uh, that the fixed monthly fee bolting on the fractional CFO is an additional thing uh is the is the best way to do that and it's a little difficult in the beginning well i i'm curious so see if this uh, makes sense as people come to you and say hey I'm, I'm thinking about using a plan guru tool is your sense that they're seeing the opportunity for a new service offering to really become an advisor and doing that or do you think it yeah. do you get the sense that for most people it's no i already do this and i just need a tool to do it a little bit better do you do you feel like people see a big opportunity in front of them I feel like, I mean, the vast majority of the people that uh, we encounter and that we see in any space are aspirational CFOs, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I, I always joke that I've, uh, you know, never, you know, we go, we go to these conferences and we uh, meet all these people people like QuickBooks Connect and Scaling New Heights. And, and these are all these, you know, forward thinking, C, you know, CPA firms, mm -hmm. at least, right, that are there to learn about the QuickBooks right. ecosystem and, and, and optimize business processes while uh, getting those accounting records automatically, you know, that's what all those solutions do, right? Like you begin to think everyone's like that. <laughs> but, you know, I just, again, when I'm out at some kind of event or out meeting people are, are working with uh, firms through other entrepreneurial things I'm involved in. I, I find very few firms really get this stuff at all. I mean, I'm sure it's changing and, and uh, there are a lot of firms adapting, but I still feel like they're all um, still in the early stages uh, the, of the majority of the people that we're exposed to, uh, you know, even in those forums where you've got people that are for, you know, that are looking for that, that have been, you know, sort of attending, you know, we've got some people that have uh, seen our CPE courses over the years and constantly are, uh, um, have so much ambition to get into this, but again, sort of struggle where the rubber meets the road. And I'm sure that's uh, why what you do at Summit is so popular. You know, we we can't get into some like we can't start 
having discussions with our clients about personnel and things like that. Like it's not, we couldn't, you know, that's not our business. Sure, we don't, sure. even, we don't yeah. even know, you know, like you, you got a client. Okay. We'll solve right. the problem. Like, you know, but, yes. uh, but sort of everything that comes before that is just, uh, you know, and everyone's just so busy too, you know, um, they're just so busy with their current workloads and everything. And I mean, when, when, mm -hmm. when I, when I ask in playing guru university, what's your biggest, um, you know, bottleneck to growth, it's always people, you know, it's always sure. human resource. It's always, you know, good people that can d help them do some of these things that they've been striving to achieve for a while. Um, but I do really, you know, I, could have say, though, tool I do feel like it is like we're really at a tipping point, though, um, where mm. people are starting to recognize they have to do this. And, and again, I don't mean to chew you guys horn, but I mean, you're, you've been a big part of that, I think, you know, just the profile that you and Jody have uh, I mean. in the industry, um, the success you have, I think people then like, you know, I didn't mean to start off the meeting so negatively by talking about how you're, you're going to fail if you don't do this stuff. But I do think some <laughs> like, uh, I do think people are seeing the writing on the wall that uh, there's a lot of people listening to, to, to you. And, uh, and if they don't get going here pretty soon, they're, they're going to be on the wrong side of this. Um, mm. So I do think again, while I, while the majority of the people we speak to are still are, you know, in that, earlier phase of it, they're now committed to it and they're, and they're going in, you know, and they're doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I think it's a win-win. I mean, I think clients, like you said, they're going to start demanding it rightfully. So, you know, in order to stay, I mean, the, the environment these days, the economy, everything just moves at lightning speed. So you always have to be kind of looking to the future. But also, I think as a profession, it, it provides, it, it is a revenue opportunity. And, and as you mentioned, I think that the idea is to at least charge monthly for an ongoing engagement. There are some people that do, you know, project-based financial forecasts, and those might fit. But for us at Summit, we incorporate it into different service tiers, whether it's included or not included, and it becomes a part of our weekly cadence because all of our decision making goes back to that. So, um, you know, our average CFO client, we're charging about $80,000 a year now. And so it's really important not just to build a plan, um, but to help them maintenance it and make sure that they're always kind of changing yeah. and evolving with it. Uh, I, I, I did remember what I was going to say earlier when okay. I was trying to thought, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think some people struggle with it's their first or second about the pricing. It's their first or second engagement. And, and they don't necessarily have a ton of confidence in themselves to like, to be able to deliver this. Sure. And then they go, right. uh, you know, they're reluctant to price it at a point where they might do a ton of work and it doesn't work out, but then they're also reluctant to like ask the client for 10,000 bucks up front for right. something that they've never even sold before, you know? So it's, do you charge that onboarding fee or not? Um, and if you don't like what happens if it doesn't stick? I mean, I kind of encourage people that on your first couple engagements, you, you just work with us to figure out what it's going to really take each month. We'll come up with a price and just, don't charge them an onboarding fee. They're your sort of test case. You know, you're, you're sure. doing, you're learning here, you know, you're maybe not in a position to charge an onboarding fee yet. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, maybe, but I mean, I, I would argue in the flip side, I mean, imposter syndrome is real and and stuff that comes just innately to us in finance that we just think is yeah. so duh is not duh right. to the client. Right. And so there's, so there's that part of it. And then the other thing is too, whenever I hear like failure to launch from people that like go through the course and they're like having a hard time, like getting started, I'm like, don't worry about it. You're going to so mm -hmm. over service this first client. If you try, I guarantee that if you charge them $10,000 or $20,000, you're going to you know, you're going to over service right. that client. Your problem is going to be is how to dial down client two, three, and four so that yes. you can scale because you're really going to dig in and this person's going to get a ton of value. So don't, so don't be intimidated by billing what you're worth up front. The fact is, is I think you'll probably give it away, mm -hmm. you know, even if you charge a fair price because the amount of effort that you're going to put into it and, uh, and, and just know that your skills and experience are, you know, definitely validate the, the, the fee. Well, I so I, I challenge people if, to kind of think. Yeah. Yeah. I, sure. I, I just, I just think that, I, I, I mean, just the quality of, 
Well, I mean, just, I mean, I think just the quality of people that I talk to, it's like, it, it seems stupid and easy to them, but I'm just saying like, whenever you're working with really bright people that are succeeding in business, this is not right. their strong suit. And I'm sure nuclear fission seems, fusion seems very easy and simple to somebody that does that kind of stuff every day, but explaining it to me, uh, you couldn't do it if you had 10 years to do it, you know, that kind of a thing. So I'm just saying like, you got to take that perspective and, and get people to get out there and jump. Yeah, I, yeah, think. I think you're right. So, and I think that's one of the best pieces of advice. Someone getting started, you're going to learn so much more by trying one, get a friendly client that you have, who's willing to do this with you, charge them a fair price and learn. And in three or four months, you're so much better than taking 10 CPE classes and doing seminars and asking people and asking if you can see their models. And Christian, I would hope that you see that with people just saying, hey, let us help you build one. And you're going to say, oh, look at all the mistakes I made with the first one. If I turned around and did this again, I'd be so much better the second time. And now I can yeah. do something more complicated. No, I mean, the, the folks that take the leap and push in, uh, mm -hmm. are, you know, tend to be successful. It's just that people are busy and this is a big transition. And, it is. Uh, you know, and, and again, I think, you give a lot of your firm gives a lot of good advice to help people manage all the stuff outside of just building the model, like like all we focus on. So. Yeah. So for um, someone starting up, we're coming toward a kind of wrapping down. But is, is someone starting up? What are some of the key resources Plan Guru offers to people to say, okay, you've only yeah. used Excel and you, you thought that was a tough experience or you loved it, whatever. But what does Plan Guru help do to help people so, sort of take those steps? So Plan Guru, you know, Adam earlier mentioned Plan Guru University, yep. and I, you know, and I don't want to uh, encourage you to attend that and watch the recordings. We we get into budgeting, forecasting theory. You know, we we talk mm -hmm. about topics that are outside of the of the product itself. You know, that kind of uh, discussion of you know, how detailed should we get, you know, the, the, you know, how, how should we set this up? We, uh, at an organizational level, I mean, we get into some of that, um, but it's, but there is a lot of product in there, but if you're really just trying to onboard a, a customer, our video tutorial library, which is right on our homepage, um, is really extensive. Uh, we pick up the phone at playing guru, you know, whoever picks up the phone has a high likelihood they'll be able to help you if your question's quite simple. Um, if it's not, it, it, there's a hundred percent probability the person who picks up the phone won't be able to help you if your question's quite simple. The problem is sometimes the questions aren't that simple, sure. you know, and then, and then we set up a go to meeting. Um, we uh, were $99 a month for your first three clients and then $29 a month for each additional client after that. So I will say we're obviously in the affordable end of things. Mm -hmm. uh, down the road, if your client has multi departmental or um, or needs like a NetSuite integration, you know, there's obviously, it's not gonna be 99 a month, sure. but, uh, <laughs> or 29 a month. Um, but the point is even for that flat, that small fee, um, we'll provide unlimited budgeting analyst assistance on your first two engagements. And now that doesn't mean we're gonna build your first two engagements for you. If you want us to do that, we will, but you're gonna, you're gonna pay us <laughs> a little bit more, but, but we will, you know, meet with you. Uh, once, twice a week, work through those conceptual design issues um, and ask the broad questions that we always ask. Uh, have them go back to the company, you know, see if we can get the data this way, see how much work is going into that and work them through those, the, the, that uh, difficult thing that we talked about earlier. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and that's some folks we don't even talk to. They just watch our tutorials. They figure it out. Others want more assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're happy to work with you however you want. Uh, you know, we're happy to walk you through your set, first setup and import process. Um, if you do need, if you are in a fire drill, you know, like, in, and you do need to get something done and you, you just got to go down the double dime on your first time down, uh, we do charge, we do have what we call Plain Guru launch. Mm -hmm. uh, and we charge about, usually charge about $250 an hour for that. And you're usually getting two budgeting analysts uh, involved. So it's, again, uh, we try to keep it affordable because it's not a long-term, uh, it's not a long-term so like solution. We don't want to be doing work for people every month, sure. uh, but we, we want to encourage people to get help if they, if they need it. Um, and so you can sort of beyond the first two, but beyond just the, 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 you know, the regular, the sort of biweekly cadence, um, that we give for free. If you do need like extensive yeah. help, you know, we can, <laughs> we can jump in at two fifteen an hour and, and get you through any, any fire drill. Okay. I like the model. This sounds very much like a teach a person to fish 
model, right? It sounds like you want people to be able to be self-sufficient, oh, which is the best solution. But I love that if you find yourself in a bind. I'd rather be walking new customers through, uh, you know, their first time through and setting them free than coming back and helping people time after time, uh, you know, f- set up their, their companies and charging them for yeah. it. So. Yeah, no, this is great, Christian. Appreciate it. I mean, FP&A software and the service is um, definitely evolving and, and uh, gaining a lot of traction in the space. I think it's going to be uh, super important. My, my, I'll, I'll kind of leave you with my latest uh, example of this. We were working with a client and we were telling them about three months in advance, hey, um, you know, the, the front line's getting a little too close, you know, so we're always trying to push mm-hmm. the front line a little further and a little further out. And we were explaining to him, hey, you had a really bad month. And we're like, oh, that's okay. It was just a bad month. And we're like, yeah, it's starting to dip into our cash reserves. We need to really kind of keep looking at our forecast. And we told him that kind of month after month for about two months. And then before, you know, by the time we got to that second or third month, they looked at their next three month pipeline and they're like, Hey guys, what's going on with our cash? What's happening? We're like, well, this is the story we've been telling you. And this is what we've been explaining. And they just, you know, they'd never been, they've been in business for 15 years, never had to consider layoffs, never had cash flows uh, dip to that level. And they were super concerned. But the beauty of this, the, of, of what happened was that we've, had a very dynamic plan from them from day one. We had the entire thing surrounded. So in an afternoon, we could really quickly play out um, building them a smaller house, like getting them into a profitable Mm -hmm. situation going forward. Now, did it mean layoffs? Of course it did. But we could tell them how many and when. And we could do it not only just tell them, you know, this should work out, but we could show them what it meant to top line sales and their pipeline, bottom line profitability. And more importantly, from a timing perspective, what it meant from cash, how much severance we could give. We built all that into the model in just a Mm -hmm. few hours because we already had everything in there. And those guys were like, this is the hardest thing we've ever done. But uh, without you guiding us through it, they're like, we would have just started making guesses and wouldn't have known whether we were doing it or not. And we turned a really negative situation into at least from a understanding, a very positive experience, knowing what they needed to do and when they needed to do it. That's a great story. Yeah. Man, what what about putting yourself in the advice role, right? That's great, Adam. You know, we always, I mean, that's one of the big things I, you know, not to get this started up again, but we, I always talk about being ready on a dime. Yep. Like, you know, when you're doing this work regularly, yeah, okay, uh, it's the forecast meeting. The last three months, not, it was boring, nothing happened, you know, but, you know, you know we just kept, you know, but uh, hopefully that's what happens, right? Uh, but uh, if, you, if you're doing this stuff regularly and something bad happens, big piece of equipment breaks down, somebody leaves the company, you're ready to respond. You're ready to turn around and run to the bank by the end of the week if necessary. So the, the benefits, uh, you know, keep adding up yeah, yeah. to the point where you got to do yeah. it. So, Christian, awesome. thank you so much. This is really helpful um, to go through both emphasizing thank forecasting you. and then talk a little bit about Plan Guru as one of the solutions people could have. Thanks awesome. for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving modern CPA firm success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.